Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode. This is going on the Clinical Trials Guru channel, as well as the podcast, the Clinical Research Circle, the YouTube channel, the podcast on podcast platforms everywhere. So make sure you like, subscribe, share, and leave a comment. We have a very special guest for you. We have a company that we've covered before, actually, one that we're actually all personally interested in lineage cell therapeutics symbol L C T X. And we've got CEO Brian Coley on the show all the way from San Diego, which is only an hour away from us. So welcome, Brian. How's everything? Hi, Dan. Everything's great. Thanks for the invitation. And I'm happy to be here. Yeah. I want to get to the results because you guys just released some results, which we were waiting for. You know, last time I did the video on LCTX, it was in February, right around Valentine's Day. And I said, hey, one of the upcoming catalysts is going to be this quarter two, 2021 release of the data from the dry aged uh, macular degeneration study. And that those came out. So we want to get to that. But before we get into that, I just wanted to give everyone an opportunity to get to know you, who you are, a little bit of your background as a um, a person who has been in multiple leadership positions in biotech and life sciences. So can you just give us like a brief overview of who you are and how you got started in this stuff? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, uh, I'll try and make it brief. I feel like I've been doing this a long time now. Uh, this is the third public company that I've been the CEO for. Um, but if I go a little bit earlier into my career, I came up through a business development path, um, you know, buying and selling the rights to develop therapies for, for different companies. Um, but even before that, I worked in technology transfer for UC San Diego. And before that, I started my career as a lab guy. You know, I was a, a card carrying, white lab coat wearing bench scientist uh, and was enrolled in a PhD program for biochemistry and molecular biology. Uh, I actually left that program early to pursue more of, a, of an industry career, uh, which I've been really happy with. So I've been fortunate to be able to be on both sides of the business with the basic research as well as the, the corporate side. And uh, most of that career has been out here in San Diego, which is just a delightful place to, to do the life science work. Yeah, it's a hub. Judy Galindo's from San Diego. It's, a, it's definitely a biotech hub. Uh, being up here in Orange County, Chris and I go down often to biz dev or to pitch our CRO services to the small cap biotechs. Um, I like the fact that you, you're a scientist first. You know, a lot of these companies, as they mature and get bigger, they start bringing in professional CEOs. And that's not you. you. You started as a scientist first. How important do you think that is to establishing the culture at, at these small cap companies? Well, I think it, it really depends. Uh, are there CEOs without scientific backgrounds that can be successful? Yes, absolutely. We, we see that. Do I think it's easier to have been at the bench and to understand the data in that more uh, detailed, you know, to have, to have lived it, to know what it's like to see experiments succeed and fail and to be able to have a much broader basis uh, or exposure to data and the data analytical process. Yeah, I think it's very helpful. I rely on it every single day. Um, but I think that, you know, success can come in a lot of different shapes, but having those tools, um, I know that I find it beneficial in my role, even if I don't wear the lab coat anymore. Yeah. How, I mean, what we're going to get into the science because we got some exciting data that was just presented at Arvo, I think it was right for the, um, cohort four of the patients. Well, I want to get into that, but just to let people know in the pipeline, we also have spinal cord injury and non-small cell lung cancer uh, in the pipeline for this company. Usually a company this size only has like one thing in the pipeline. You guys have three things. I have a personal question for you as a, as a CEO of a publicly traded company, something I've never done. How difficult is it to not get caught up in the stock price for you? <laughs> what a great question. Um, you know, it, it, it also varies. Probably every answer to today is going to be, you know, it depends or it varies. Um, I think the reality is you, you, need to, you need to have balance. And so am I aware of my share price every day? Almost. Uh, am I aware of it every hour? Absolutely not. Um, 
<laughs> if, if it moves, I mean, look, I don't, I don't know a CEO that if you, if you have a press release going out, like I don't know anybody who isn't up pre-market to see, you know, if, if something's happening. This is how we're measured. This is our scorecard. We care about creating value, but at the same time, it really isn't a day to day or, or quarter by quarter business. It takes, you know, 12 or 15 years to go from step one to the final step of getting a product approved. And so you, you would die if you, uh, if you, you know, followed your share price and allowed that to define you on a daily basis, you really have to strike a balance. So, um, you know, I, I keep track of what's going on and, you know, you know, even on social media, I've got a general sense. I've got people in the organization who help summarize things for me. So I, you know, I know what's going on with the share price. I know what's going on macro, but I take also a very long view because listen, as, as CEO, you, you, you know, one of the things that people don't, uh, who haven't done it, you know, might not necessarily appreciate is when your stock goes up 25%, it's the investor who takes credit for being smart. And when your stock is down 3%, it's the CEO who gets blamed for not doing enough. So if, if you can't handle that, this is not the job for you. <laughs> <laughs> it's 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 yeah. your fault only when it goes against the investors. Uh, the, this is very true. Um, yeah. This, I've done the background. I've done the due diligence. We all have actually uh, multiple times. This is like, in my opinion, this is not a company you trade. This is a company that if you believe in it, you invest long-term because this has good stuff in the pipelines, um, much needed treatments, which we're about to get into with Operagen. Uh, but before we do that, and before we get into the data that just came out, May 3rd, this is May 6th for those watching in the future. Does anyone else have any questions for Brian about his career before we get into the, the press release on the exciting data that came out? I mean, obviously, we, I would love to know more about his career, but like he said, he's probably take <laughs> too long because it seems that Brian was born to be a CEO. <laughs> yeah, his background's actually, uh, you know, I'm looking at the LinkedIn. There's there's multiple companies, like you said, three companies that were publicly traded. Um, uh, I'm curious about the biz dev aspect, but maybe we can do that on another podcast. But anyone else have uh, any questions? No, nothing here. I'm really interested in hearing about the data and science and everything. Yeah, you guys want the data. This is what <laughs> this is what moves markets. So this is great data that came out, Brian. You wanna you wanna give us an overview of, of what 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 uh, the data was that you guys presented? Yeah, of course. So um, Arvo is is uh, a major medical conference. There are uh, two that cover ophthalmology that people tend to orient to. So it's always good to have a presence at the major medical conferences because it's the surgeons and physicians that are, that are really important to uh, evaluating and providing credibility for your data. Uh, the data that we provided was an update of a clinical trial that has 24 patients. Uh, this clinical trial is open label, meaning the data over time uh, grows in size and it matures in terms of its, its age. So we're following patients over time. So this conference was a nice opportunity to provide an update. And what we updated on the 24 patients were some of the most important variables that you look for in people who have dry age-related macular degeneration. So that includes things like how many letters on an eye chart can you read? That's correct uh, visual acuity. Um, how large is the wound in the back of the eye? That's called the geographic atrophy. That's the problem in this condition is that retina cells die off and it forms a wound in the back of the eye. But we also reported on safety, which is always paramount to, uh, to our work because ultimately the FDA evaluates not just the benefit, but also the safety profile of any treatment. And we reported patient reported outcomes or PRO. So this is a patient saying how they feel about their treatment. And sometimes it's a more generic kind of uh, question like mood. And sometimes it's more specific like your ability to read a book or reading speed. So we provided an update and I'm really pleased that uh, directionally everything continued to be encouraging and promising uh, that seemed to us to suggest that treatment with our Operagen RPE cells does seem to be driving a positive clinical outcome in these patients. And this is the only treatment right now, um, currently for dry age related macular degeneration, there is nothing on the market, right? Mm -hmm. 
There, yeah, there are two types of AMD. Uh, they're called wet and dry. We do have therapies for wet AMD. It's a different condition, and it's th those are incredibly successful. I mean, upwards of ten billion dollars a year of sales. But there wow. is nothing, nothing yet for dry AMD, even though it's far more common. It's eight, nine times more common, but yet there's never, never been anything approved for it. So it really is a, an open opportunity for the companies that are trying to come up with new therapies to treat dry AMD. Uh, uh, the updated results presented at Arvo 2021 included a minimum of four and a half months of follow-up in all 24 patients treated with Oprogen. Nine of 24 patients were treated with the thaw and inject formulation, two via a standard Parsplana vitrectomy PPV, and seven utilizing the orbit subretinal delivery system. Can you talk about those three different, um, I guess, cohorts? Yeah, one of the nice things that you can do in these early clinical trials is you can uh, demo or pilot a few things. So one of the things that we developed and introduced is the thaw and inject formulation. So you now, why would you do that? Uh, well, uh, you know, first the the benefit is you are literally taking the cells out of a frozen state. You're thawing them, which you know just takes a few minutes, and then you're loading them into the injection chamber and injecting them into the patient's eye. That is actually a huge accomplishment. And the reason why I say that is that for many cell therapies, perhaps most cell therapies, you actually have to prepare the cells a day before. They may need to be washed or plated and handled. That introduces the potential for errors, that has a lot of logistical headache associated with it, and a lot of sites aren't equipped to be able to handle cells in that way. So by eliminating all of what's called dose prep, and getting it down to where you're literally just taking a, a vial of cells, warming it in a, a special warming device, and then putting them into the, the injection device and, and in, injecting them into the patient, that is providing us with a far more appealing and easy to use commercial profile for our cells than what was used in the earliest patients where it really was the day before cells were being plated out and they had to be harvested. And it, it's just not commercially viable or easy to deploy in that form. So for us, it was really important to create a thaw and inject formulation. The other thing that we've been piloting or, or demoing is how to administer the cells. And that's because it's very important to us that the cells get to the right location. Um, you can't inject these cells into the bloodstream. They need to be in exactly the right place in the eye. It's called the subretinal space, and they need to be close to the area of atrophy. That means they need to be close to the wound that is in the eye. And so the traditional way, as you mentioned, is to use pars planovitrectomy or PPV. And that's basically going in the front door. But there's another device that had been developed by a different company where you can actually thread a needle around the back of the eye and come up underneath the retina to deposit the cells. So we've been comparing the two. Naturally, they have trade-offs and we're just trying to figure out which of those two would be the better one to proceed in a commercial version of our product. And so that's what those two, uh, those two items, the PPV and the Orbit device, and as well the Thon Inject formulation are all about it's collecting data to try and come up with the best possible, easy to use, easy to adopt, easy to deploy commercial profile for our Oprogen cells. Brian, um, I would like to know more, a little, a little bit more about the competitive advantage that the lineage uh, has, because I think it's a very interesting topic that people should know about. Uh, Monica, I appreciate that question because I think it really is very important. Uh, cell therapy is a new technology still, and a lot of people don't really know about all of the differences about cell therapy. One of the things that I think is the most exciting about cell therapy is that the use of whole cells is, um, is so powerful. And so if you have a disease like dry AMD, for which the hallmark is the death of retina cells, that's what's happening, retina cells die off. Um, a lot of people are trying to figure out why those retina cells are dying off. And they're trying to uh, you know, boost or change certain molecular pathways. And they have to choose the right one, right? That's one of the big challenges in drug development is you have to find a molecule that interrupts a pathway so that you can drive a change. For cell therapy, and in particular lineage's approach, 
I don't care what's wrong in the cell. I don't have to guess, is it pathway one or pathway two or pathway 5,614? We are replacing the entire cell. So that gives us a much larger TAM or total addressable market because all of the different things that go wrong in the cell, we are basically repairing all of them. And an analogy that I like to use, and maybe I use it too often, but if you were to get into a car and it did not start, you don't know if it's because the battery's dead or there's no gas or the starter's not operating or, you know, there could be a hundred different reasons. And you don't have time to try and try all of those different things. So what Lineage does is we just give you a new car. Your old car is no good. Here's a new car. Here's a new RPE cell to take over where the old one has died off or has become dysfunctional. And in doing so, we are really harnessing the power of cell therapy. So uh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm just curious, and maybe you've already mentioned this, but um, these cells, are they the subject cells or are these cells created in the lab and how do they match so the body doesn't reject them if so? Those are great questions, Chris. So the, the answer is that we use a cell line. It's a cell line that is, uh, it's called pluripotent. So the cells have the ability to become any of the different cells in the body. So they're basically like a, a child that hasn't decided if it wants to be a doctor or a lawyer or a car salesman or what. These cells have um, the capacity, if they get the right information, to become kidney cells or liver cells or bone or brain. And we have a recipe. And our recipe turns these cells into retina cells and only into retina cells. So we first grow them into huge numbers, right? We thaw them from the freezer, we grow them into massive, massive numbers, and then we provide the instructions. Basically, we expose them to certain chemicals and other special conditions that are proprietary to us. And at the end, the output of that recipe is a pure population of just retina cells. And we're currently manufacturing in a three liter bioreactor. So about the size of a milk jug, we're manufacturing 5 billion retina cells. So we can manufacture thousands of clinical courses in just three liters. And it's fairly straightforward to go to higher scale. And what's important about not using the patient's cells and avoiding the cost of a personalized medicine is that we can drive down the cost of our therapy massively because we can scale the cells so high. And then you had the right follow-up question, which is, well, why don't people reject it? If they're not the patient's own cells, why aren't they rejected? And the answer is largely due to the fact that the eye has what's called immune privilege. It does not, it's not filled with a bunch of white blood cells floating around looking for foreign material. The eye is very tolerant of foreign material. But just to be extra cautious, we provide immunosuppressive drugs to the patients. We used to put them on immunosuppression for a year. We've got that down now to about 90 days. And actually more recently, we had a patient who didn't receive the, the, the more powerful of the two immunosuppressive drugs, didn't receive it at all uh, in connection with COVID. And that patient still has been able to retain their graft or retain the plant transplant. So we've never had a single case of uh, acute or delayed rejection. And we've got patients that have had the cells in their eyes now for more than five years. Interesting. Was that, um, oh, was the amino, was, was the immunosuppressive drug, uh, part of the inclusion and exclusion criteria for, uh, for the is, study? It is a requirement for the patients to, to take the immunosuppressive drugs. Um, the one that most people focus on is called tacrolimus. So we give them low dose tacrolimus, uh, for about 90 days and then they they come off of it. We had two patients that had a reduction or a modified program. One that I mentioned uh, because of COVID, they didn't want to be immunosuppressed when there was COVID in their, in their environment. And so that was fine. The other one was not able to take tacrolimus. I think it was a kidney condition or kidney session. So they were eligible for the study. We were able to put them on study, but we said, look, you may reject these cells. Uh, and you know, there's informed consent and they wanted to go forward. And we have updated uh, fairly recently that you know, that patient's cells are still present in their eye. So we're really happy that we have been able to really diminish and continue to minimize the annoyance or the nuisance of being immunosuppressed without seeing rejection of the cells, because that's something that people fear with cell therapy. How do I know that this, this is gonna last? Right. How do I know that I'm not gonna have funny things growing in my eye? Um, and that's never happened because we use pure RPE cells. We don't put other cell types into the eye. 
this for a, that, uh, go ahead, Monica. Okay, thank you. So Brian, uh, how far advanced the condition is on the patients that participated in the study? Well, the patients uh, vary. Uh, this is pretty standard for clinical trials is that you start with the most severe patient because you're always concerned with safety. So the first time you go into a human being, um, you want to be as, as safe as you can. So you, we don't treat normal, healthy individuals. We only treat people who have the condition. And we actually began with people who had very severe disease. So we, uh, the first 12 patients that we treated, they were all legally blind. And so you can imagine that you're not going to do a lot of harm to someone's vision if they're already legally blind. And so that allowed us to collect safety data and durability or sustainability to look at the graphs, to look for anatomical changes to the eye. After we were comfortable and our data safety monitoring board and FDA, after everyone was comfortable that we could move from legally blind patients into patients that had better baseline vision, right? Some of our patients could still drive a car, so they had you know, functional vision. That was really exciting for us because I think that the effect is a lot easier to observe in someone whose disease is not quite as advanced. Um, it's similar to cancer. If someone has a single tumor and you can carve it out, that's, uh, they're going to have a better outcome than someone who has 50 tumors all over their body. But you still start by treating people who have the most severe disease. So we have been moving directionally toward patients that are, uh, that are better off, that have uh, a greater chance of benefit. And we have actually seen a greater benefit in those patients that more accurately reflect our intended patient population. So it's been really nice to see sort of all of the evidence kind of hanging together that mechanistically, as we go into earlier stage patients, and I hope we'll go even earlier, but as we've gone in that direction, we're seeing better clinical outcomes, which really does make sense for this disease and for this treatment. I see. Yeah. The question I was going to ask, usually for a phase one, two study like this one, uh, the studies are shorter. This one, you're, you're analyzing the patients up to three years post-transplant. Is that correct? Well, I'll make a distinction. We are going to follow the patients for a full five years, which is an FDA standard for cell and gene therapy. But the area, or excuse me, the observation period, which we care about is mostly the first 12 months. So I'm curious as a, as a, you know, scientist and business person, I'm curious about how long the benefit lasts. And I hope that it does last a lifetime. I hope this is a one-time treatment, mm -hmm. but in terms of building a clinical trial and getting a product approved, we're really thinking about the first 12 months. What kind of changes do we see? So we would not be running a large clinical trial where we have to wait five years to, to announce data. That, that wouldn't be very productive. Okay. That, that's where I'm leading towards. So the next, you know, the next study, phase two slash three, I mean, I imagine you guys are planning it. I imagine you guys are ha very happy with these results. Are you having these conversations yet with the FDA as far as planning the next study for this? Those conversations are going on internally and with our advisors, and we're mapping out all of the different scenarios that we could pursue, thinking about different statistical uh, models that we would use and patient criteria for enrollment and exclusion and all of that. Uh, but we haven't gone to talk to FDA about a proposed plan yet. We want to collect a little bit more data. We want to have at least six months of safety data on all of the patients before we talk to the FDA. But we'll talk to the FDA in the second half of the year. And that's exactly what we will talk about is the design for the next study, what we want to measure, how many patients we want to treat, how long we will monitor them, and really get agreement around what would define a successful outcome. I see. So six months, at least six months on um, the latest patient. Uh, how far away are you guys from that? Uh, not far. <laughs> Next month. Okay. Or, uh, oh, you, okay. Yeah, you gave us a date. So June, we should have six months of, of safety data on everyone. And so, you know, you need to compile the data, you need to analyze it, you prepare, you request a meeting with the FDA. So, um, you know, it could be Q3, but we also want to, you know, there are other factors, you know, for, for investors to, to know about. You know, there are other companies out there that are planning to release data. And so it's kind of nice to think about maybe seeing what the other guy has to show his cards uh, before we, you know, make our decisions. Uh, but, you know, it's an ongoing process, but we certainly are thinking a lot about what we're going to do next as our data continues to look good. Gotcha. And then you also have the other studies in the pipeline. Can you talk, do you, 
do you feel like talking a little bit about uh, those other two uh, studies that you have in the pipeline? I would love to. I, I really, I, I just really connect with this spinal cord program. Um, and the reason for that more than anything else for me is that um, I, I just, you know, these are typically young people and nobody expects to have a spinal cord injury, right? Primal life, surfboard, diving board, you know, mountain bike, car crash. Um, it just gets torn away from them. And, you know, their, their, their brains and their souls are the, are the same, but their bodies just aren't functional. And to me, that's just such a travesty. And for thousands of years, there's been nothing we can do for spinal cord patients. So I'm really excited about manufacturing a different kind of cell, not a retina cell, but a spinal cord cell and transplanting it into patients because we've seen some very encouraging data from the 25 individuals who've received our treatment to date um, that truly support going into a larger comparative clinical trial in that setting. Uh, and then we manufacture a third kind of cell for oncology. We can manufacture dendritic cells, which can present antigens to your immune system and help effectively boost your immune system and your response to a tumor. Uh, and that may have application in many different areas. In fact, we recently announced our first uh, you know, paid alliance, corporate alliance, uh, where another company is, is uh, paying us to access and utilize our technology for the first of what could become many deals based on that platform. So yeah, it's, it's just, it's wonderful to have three clinical programs, all making progress, all, you know, so far looking pretty good. Um, you know, it gives us a good platform from which we can continue to grow and, and hopefully be very successful bringing this new field of medicine forward. Yeah, I encourage everyone to go to the Lineage Cell Therapeutics website. We'll actually have the link to the video underneath um, for the uh, spinal cord injury. There is a video highlighting the progress made by one of the patients, Chris Boson and, and Lucas Linder, both of whom received the OPC1 cell therapy following traumatic spinal cord injury. So the progress they made is amazing. I mean, I guess... Um, a video is worth a thousand words. So we'll have the link underneath this video so you can go check that out. Um, that was a good decision by you guys also to feature like patient, what real patient stories on, on, on the website. You don't see that too often uh, for drug companies these days. Uh, these, the, you need people who have had a good experience to be willing to, to publicize their, their experience. And then we have a bunch of them and our website, I mean, it's a little bit of mind boggling here, but, our website has so much great content from patients and from leading physicians talking about our science. It's right there. I mean, people can access it and, and we put a lot of it on there. Um, and it's, it's just been, it's been a great place to direct people to say, well, look, don't take my word for it, right? I'm biased, I'm the CEO of the company, but why don't you go watch some patient videos um, we recently had uh, a national rollout of a story that was done for one of our dry AMD patients. She's a you know, delightful lady who who makes donuts and, you know, they've got her, you know, going up really close to see is it a jelly donut or a chocolate donut because her vision is so bad. And she she had a great experience with our technology, with our with her therapy, and she called it life changing. So, you know, that that's out there and you can find similar stories from some of the spinal cord patients and, you know, how, how happy they have been uh, going through this and, and thankful. And uh, that's why we want to keep, you know, providing this to, to people and generating that content and, you know, showing people the power of, of our type of cell therapy. Yeah, I yeah, mean, this even, is- Even for investors, the website is, is great. <laughs> Yeah, this is not a financial advice to anybody. It never has been. But uh, this is to encourage you guys as social investors, our role as social investors are to educate you guys on things that we think are interesting and potentially game changing and lineage. I mean, like I said, this is May. I did the first video in February. So in between February and May, I've covered like 25 other companies probably. This one still sticks in my mind. Like when I got the email, it's like, I know exactly what you guys do because of the website, because of the, the technology that you guys have. So not financial advice. My opinion is this is a long-term play, obviously very early. All three candidates are in phase one slash two. Um, but guess what? Many phase one slash two studies become phase two slash three. And with enough time, become commercialized. So as a social investor, that's my duty is to bring you guys the information. You guys go do your own due diligence, go down the rabbit hole, 
my opinion, this is a good company to just buy and hold. Uh, and the technology is amazing. So Ashley, I think you brought that up on one of the other videos we were doing. Uh, you, you like to invest just because of the technologies, like because you, you, you think it's important to, to be involved. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, um, and I apologize for not being on camera today, but, um, yes, I actually really enjoy the technology for me. It's, um, you know, kind of like, for example, with the computer, right? We're just talking about buying new computers. If you're going to buy a new computer, you're going to look at the specs and all of that. But sometimes, you know, you just, for instance, with, with your company, um, Brian, it's the innovation is just amazing and it's, it's really mind boggling and, and all the, you know, data that the results you were just talking about right now, it's all the more reason why I believe that people should be focusing a whole lot on the team behind, you know, the technology, the data, the science, because, you know, ultimately just hearing you talk right now, you can hear the passion that you have for it and for the subjects that are involved in the trials and, um, yeah, I mean, definitely what Dan said, you know, it's just something that I would just buy and hold for sure, just because I'm how much I enjoy everything you just mentioned right now. Well, Ashley, I, I appreciate that. And I, I would be remiss not to add that I, I've been at the company for less than three years. Uh, and so I'm standing on the shoulders of giants and decades of work from people that come before me. Um, but I, you know, I, I really am excited about the technology. I feel very fortunate to be leading this company and helping to usher in this cell transplant technology. And it's, it's been a heck of a ride. And I think we're at the very beginning of it. Yeah. Good point, Brian. I think that's another podcast in and of itself, another easily half an hour. How do you get an investigational product from an idea to phase one slash two? I mean, a lot of people don't realize that's like a, sometimes a 10 year, 15 year journey just to get to the stage you're at right now. So maybe we'd have you come on and kind of give a, some, some further background for the investors. LCTX has a lot of social investor interest out there. I mean, I'm on Reddit, I'm on Discord, stock tweets. I see all the stuff there. This is one of the most discussed stock um, at, at, the, uh, at the market cap that it is. So would love to have you back on again to, to go through some of the background, like some of the history of LCTX, if you have the time for that. And uh, we thank you for coming on. We know you got to go. Does anyone else have anything else for Brian? No, no nothing. Thank you so much for everything. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. It's been my pleasure, everybody. Thank you so much. And thank you, Dan. Thank you, guys. Have a good day. And thank you, everybody, for watching and listening. And catch you all later. Bye-bye.